नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम टू सेवेंटी फर्स्ट एपिसोड ऑफ ट्रिपल ए वीकली वेबिनार सीरीज दिस इज रियली वंडरफुल दैट दिस टाइम दैट वी आर कंडक्टिंग ए वेबिनार ऑन ए सब्जेक्ट ऑन द डिमांड ऑफ प्रोफेशनल्स आई हैव बीन गेटिंग लॉर्ड ऑफ रिक्वेस्ट that we are finding difficulties how to dissolve a company when all the assets are sold and there are only some recoveries or some applications some litigations are pending so this is the problem which is probably everyone is facing whosoever is engaged in liquidation process under insolvency and bankruptcy code so we worked out uh, some of the scenarios there are various scenarios that the liquidation are pending there are some ways that we can do it and in some cases it is really not possible to something and the liquidator will have to continue or there may be a possibility of change of the liquidator if someone is not interested because now this change of the liquidator is also within the powers of stakeholders so let me come to the subject right away and we would have the flow like first we will see what are the difficulties what are the scenarios then we will see what are the uh, present law regulations and there are not many judgments on this but then still we have uh, found some of the judgments on some small issues but yes i think it is a more of more or less a discussion which we will have collective discussion collective reading that's what we can say so i'm sharing my screen and uh, let us move forward and try to discuss this issue so we are uh, trying to find out ways for faster dissolution of the companies under liquidation under ipc and we are not dealing with the winding up uh, processes under the companies act so like in case we see uh, the these are the kind of scenarios these are the kind of difficulties faced by the liquidators first is that the all the assets are sold and all the realizations are made so when i say the realizations are made i mean to say that all the sundry debtors claims refunds advances as appearing in the books of account or any other records those have been realized so this is one scenario but the only the avoidance applications or pufe applications are pending before adjudicating authority i think the ibbi is making all efforts uh, that the uh, pufe transactions uh, should not uh, be the hindrance in dissolving a company and that is uh, like they they have tried it many times but i think still the uh, the uh, market is not getting developed uh, the way ibbi is trying to resolve this issue now the second uh, kind of uh, scenario is that when all the assets are sold and realized but there are disputes regarding distribution of proceeds which is pending before ncrt so this is a second scenario then the third is all assets are sold but some litigation is pending for realization of the dues of the corporate debtor because see as per regulation 39 a liquidator is also required to realize all dues of the corporate debtor all claims all refunds all has to be realized by the liquidator under regulation 39 so that part is pending then the other the other scenario is that liquidator is not able to take control or custody of some of the assets liquidator knows that there is some asset but that asset is not yet under the custody and control and that kind of litigation is going on the liquidator is waiting for some claims to be realized refunds from government authorities etc then there may be a scenario that the liquidator is keeping the company as a going concern and some of the contracts are being implemented for maximization of the value for the stakeholders 
then the liquidator uh, is implementing some of the contracts to avoid invocation of performance bank guarantees given by the stakeholders. Now, maybe another scenario is that there is a stay on sale of some of the disputed assets by any court or by any authority. Then the last is the attachment of assets by investigation agencies or under any other matter and the matter is pending before the courts. So these are the scenarios where the liquidators are struggling and the liquidators are not uh, able to uh, dissolve the company. So first of all, uh, let, let these, when, see, we'll, we'll take up uh, uh, all these scenarios uh, uh, one by one. But first of all, let us see what is the law related to the dissolution of corporate debtors under the insolvency law. Section 54 deals, section 54 of the code deals with the law. Now it says that uh, it says that the where the assets of the corporate debtor have been completely liquidated. So the word completely liquidated is very, very important. See, when we say completely liquidated assets, and this asset also doesn't mean capital asset, fixed asset, or current asset. Assets are completely liquidated. The liquidator shall make an application to the adjudicating authority for the dissolution of such corporate debtor. The adjudicating authority shall, on application filed by the liquidator under subsection 1, order that the corporate debtor shall be dissolved from the date of that order and the corporate debtor shall be dissolved accordingly. The copy of an order would be given to the ROC wherever the, the company has been registered. Now, the whenever we discuss, we talk about completely liquidated. Now, completely liquidated is something which is a very, very difficult part. Going forward, then we can come to the regulations, regulations uh, under the liquidation process regulations. So first let us see regulation 45, which actually says that the final report has to be prepared by the liquidator prior to the distribution. When the corporate debtor is liquidated, the liquidator shall make an account of liquidation showing how it has been conducted and how the corporate debtor's assets have been liquidated. If the liquidation cost exceeds the estimated liquidation cost provided in the preliminary report, the liquidator shall explain the reasons for the same. The liquidator shall submit an application along with the final report and the compliance certificate in form H to the adjudicating authority. Two options. One option is <clears throat> closer of the liquidation process of the corporate debtor where the corporate debtor is being has been sold as a going concern and the other is for the dissolution of the company so in case the corporate debtor is sold as a going concern then we are not dissolving the company then we are only closing the liquidation process in case the corporate debtor is not being sold as a going concern it is it is being sold as uh, <clears throat> business uh, or lump sum or piecemeal then in that case the corporate debtor would be dissolved so this is the requirement <clears throat> under regulation 45 <clears throat> then uh, the regulation 44 also says that the liquidator is supposed to complete the liquidation process within one year from the liquidation commencement date, notwithstanding pendency of any application for avoidance of transactions under part two of the code before the adjudicating authority or any action thereof. Now, <clears throat> the regulations are saying again and again that liquidator should the liquidator should dissolve the company even if the avoidance transaction applications are pending. So regulation 44 is one which says that you don't bother about the avoidance transactions and you go for dissolution. If the liquidator fails to liquidate the corporate debtor within one year, then he'll make an application explaining why the extension is required. That's basically for the extension. And then again, one is the 44, then again is 44A. Now the 44A also says that the liquidator shall on the advice of the consultation committee. Now, in the earlier, it says the liquidator shall liquidate the company irrespective of, not, notwithstanding pending of the application. But now it says that the liquidator is also like having an uh, obligation on the advice of the consultation committee provide in the application along with final report filed under regulation 45 for the manner in which proceedings in respect of avoidance transactions, if any, under chapter three or fraudulent or wrongful trading under chapter six of part two of the code will be 
pursued after the dissolution or closure of the liquidation process and the manner in which the proceeds, if any, from such proceedings shall be distributed. So it means the regulation says that when we make an application for dissolving the company, in that application, we also have to mention the consent of the stakeholders on two things. One, how the proceedings, how the proceedings would be pursued who will pursue the proceedings of avoidance transactions who will make expenditure on the proceedings and in case of any recovery how the same would be distributed to the stakeholders that is the part of the application of for dissolving the company in case the company is being dissolved while the Avoidance transactions applications are pending before the adjudicating authority. So 44 says, 44A says that these are not the hurdles for dissolving the company, but of course the consultation of stakeholders is required. 44 capital A clearly says the consultation means consent of the stakeholders is required. Now, when we talk about the application for dissolution of the company, let us understand what is required by the adjudicating authority. Adjudicating authority says that in your application, you must show how the assets have been sold, for what amount it has been sold, how much is the liquidation cost, why there is a difference between in the liquidation cost as you estimated in the preliminary report and finally in this report. Also give us the audited accounts of the liquidation process, how much money came, how it, the same has been spent or distributed. Then a, a statement has to be provided that all the assets have been sold or uh, the debt of the company has been discharged to the, to the extent possible and also that no litigation is pending against the company and if there is any litigation pending, how those litigations will be uh, dealt with, how the same would be handled, and who would be uh, pursuing those litigations. And then the, again, the in some of the cases that we have seen that the adjudicating authority say that the liquidation bank account should be closed, there should not be any money in the liquidation bank account, and that should be distributed or that should be paid for expenses. Asset memorandum may be looked into because see, like we, we have seen in the hearings, then the asset memorandum is being compared with the realization. The valuation report is also being seen whether the there is still any asset left in the valuation uh, report, which was valued, but it has not been recovered. Then again, it says that the, it, like the regulation says somewhere, that this dissolution is an irreversible process. So therefore, the adjudicating authority is very careful while passing an order for dissolving the company. So, the once the company is dissolved, it is irreversible. However, in Companies Act, there, there was a provision, and, and th that was a process which was reversible, but under the IBC, there is no process of reversing the dissolution. And the therefore the nclt expects that the liquidator shall act in diligent and transparent manner and to comply with the, all the provisions so this is what is the requirement of the nclt while we try to dissolve a company now i also tried to see some of the other provisions which actually can help the liquidator in dissolving dissolving the company uh, the first is the Regulation 10, which is the disclaimer of onerous property. And I looked at the meaning of the onerous property means difficult, burdensome, oppressive, troublesome, causing hardship. So there can be some kind of assets of the company which are difficult to dispose of, which are burdensome. Burdensome means that that asset is bringing a burden on the uh, on, on the particular on the on the liquidator on the company. That asset is a troublesome asset. <clears throat> That may be a land of any tenure burdened with onerous covenants, shares or stocks in companies, any other property which is not sellable or is not readily sellable by 
reasons of the uh, possessor thereof being bound either to the performance of any onerous act or to the payment of any sum of money. So there can be some properties which are attached with some covenants, which are attached with some kind of obligations that in case you want to take possession, in case you want to take control of this property, there are something that you have to pay, there are some covenants, some obligations, and those obligations are actually very, very hard for the liquidator to comply with. These are burdensome, these are expensive. Or some, or some of the un, unprofitable contracts also, because the, uh, the company may have a joint venture, and the company may have made an investment in a joint venture, and those joint venture company is not making any profit. So then also it can be considered as an onerous property and an application can be made to the adjudicating authority for, for disclaiming the onerous property and going ahead with the deal resolution. So in case we try to find out onerous properties, difficult to sell, difficult to realize, expensive to realize, so then the adjudicating authority can pass an order that it the disclaim is allowed. The disclaiming those properties would be permitted by the adjudicating authority. So in case the liquidators are finding difficulty in realizing some of the assets, in recovering some of the assets, or even in taking control and custody of some of the assets, where the liquidator feels that either it is very, very time consuming or even the value which like which is likely to be realized is not really worth it or it is more than the expenses on the liquidation process, then this property can also be disclaimed. Now, what I was thinking that there are uh, like one is this onerous property process where the properties can be uh, kind of disclaimed. And now coming to the another part, which is regulation uh, 14. Uh, so we have seen onerous property regulation 10. We'll, we'll actually uh, recall it a little later. So in the meantime, we have also seen this regulation 14, which says any time after the preparation of the preliminary report, if it appears to the liquidator that the realizable properties of the corporate debtor are insufficient to cover the cost of the liquidation, and the affairs of the corporate debtor do not require any further investigation, he may apply to the adjudicating authority for early dissolution of the corporate debtor and for necessary directions in respect of such dissolution. So, but this is one that this is regulation 14 is under the liquidation process regulations. That means it is applicable to the liquidators, not on the resolution professionals. So we have uh, got some of the judgments where the resolution professional has made an application for early dissolution of the company, not liquidation, dissolution of the company. And there are contradictory judgments from uh, the adjudicating authorities of dif different benches. Some says that the resolution professional cannot make an application for early dissolution. It is only liquidator who can make. And in some of the cases where the adjudicating authority itself said to the RP that in case you are not able to have find any asset, in case there is no uh, claimant, then what are you doing here? Then you should dissolve the company. So in case there is no asset, there is no claimant. So that means no asset, no liability that dissolve the company. So in that case, the adjudicating authority passed an order of dissolution. However, the promoter went to the NCLAT and the promoter said that this company has been uh, like uh, uh, dissolved like this. And NCLAT in that manner said that the promoter is, uh, the, the order is right. If there is no asset, there is no business, there is no claim. Then why this company should continue? Why the liquidation process should continue? That was the NCLAT judgment. But in many judgments, in fact, we have seen that the resolution professional making an application for dissolution directly without going through the process of liquidation, that is accepted by some benches and it is not accepted by some benches. But then I feel it is it is kind of uh, uh, it is a kind of uh, fact-based decision 
and in case uh, a company is really not having any kind of asset, no liabilities, no stakeholders, then I think the a dissolution can be accepted. However, the basic uh, the basic question of law is whether the RP can make an application for dissolution of the company or not. Most of the benches are saying that the RP can make an application for liquidation and then liquidator can make an application for early dissolution in Regulation 14. And there is no applicability of Regulation 14 to resolution professional or IRP. So then going forward, we also got a kind of 37A, which was inserted uh, uh, in the regulations. And this is assignment of not readily realizable assets. So the this is also, again, when we talk about 37A, it is with the consent of the stakeholders. A liquidator may assign or transfer a not readily realizable asset through a transparent process in consultation with the stakeholders consultation committee in accordance with the regulation 31A for a consideration to any person who is eligible to submit a resolution plan for insolvency resolution of the corporate debtor. Now, in this case, for the purpose of this regulation, not readily realizable asset means any asset included in the liquidation estate which could not be sold through available options and includes contingent or disputed, disputed assets and assets underlying proceedings for preferential, undervalued, extortionate, credit and fraudulent transactions referred to in section 43 to 51 and section 66 of the code. Now, this is something that most of the liquidators are trying to work on 37A, assignment of NRRA, that's what is very commonly known. So this is also one of the options that the assignment can be done to someone. Now the assignment can be done to uh, the creditors also, number one, that's possible to make an assignment to creditors. Assignment can be also made to a market player and that market player. So I, I will come to the process of 37A and what are the kind of practical difficulties that we are finding in the process of 37A that we will discuss. But there is another option that we are finding in Regulation 38. Now the Regulation 38 says that the distribution of unsold assets, the liquidator may with the permission of adjudicating authority, distribute amongst the stakeholders an asset that could not be sold, assigned or transferred due to its peculiar nature or other special circumstances. Now, the application seeking permission of the adjudicating authority shall identify the asset, provide a value of the asset, detail the efforts made to sell the asset, if any, and provide reasons for such distribution. Now, the distribution also like now can be like since we have some assets which are still left and in that manner, we can also say that we are distributing this asset to creditor or we are distributing this asset to creditors. To my understanding, distribution also, there can be methods of distribution. One method can be assignment. The other method can be actual sale of the asset to the uh, to those uh, stakeholders. So when we talk and we, we say distribution, now the distribution method can be different. The distribution method can be totally different because when we distribute uh, money, it is transferred to the bank account of the stakeholders. When we distribute any asset, then the mode of distribution would be different for different assets. Now, if it is a car, the car would be transferred under the Motor Vehicle Act. If it is a property, the property would be transferred under the provisions of Transfer of Property Act. And if it is something which is a, a movable item, a goods, and those goods would be transferred, distributed by way of uh, an invoice, which the liquidator will issue to the uh, stakeholder. So in case of any kind of debt, 
that will be assigned under the uh, Indian Contract Act. So distribution means a decision that the liquidator will take that I will I will transfer this asset to so and so stakeholder. However, the mode of distribution will include uh, sale, assignment, and depending upon the asset which is being distributed and also the value of that asset so that it should be considered and but then it is also requiring the adjudicating authority's permission so now we actually have seen in case you see we've seen uh, there are options available one is the regulation 10 for the regarding the onerous property and where we can disclaim in that case also adjudicating authority's permission is required Second is 37A, which is the not readily realizable asset under regulation 37A, where the stakeholder's consent is required. Again, coming to regulation 38, which is the distribution of unsold assets to stakeholders, where the adjudicating authority's consent is required. Then in case we come to the uh, regulation 44A, the treatment of avoidance transactions application that also requires stakeholders approval. So in case we try to find out four ways, onerous property, adjudicating authority, NRRA, stakeholders consultation committee, distribution of assets, the adjudicating authority, treatment of avoidance transaction applications, the stakeholders consultation committee. So these are the four options that we have where we can kind of get rid of these assets Regulation 10, Regulation uh, 37A, Regulation 38, and Regulation 44A. So in, in case we try to use these regulations, then let us see the practical difficulties and also the resistance from the COC. Let us see that. So now we have seen that there are only four ways to kind of deal with the difficult assets. So let us try to see how we can actually handle it. Now, then we try to see the, uh, let us see the practically what the stakeholders expect from us. The When we talk about stakeholders, the stakeholders are saying that the, uh, the liquidator should, in fact, complete the process. Because in most of the liquidation assignments, the liquidator's fee is decided as per the regulation 4, where the fee is payable in case there is any asset is sold and the value is realized. So one is on the uh, realization and the other part of the fee is on distribution. So realization and, realization and distribution, if it doesn't happen, then there is no fee to the liquidator as per regulation four. However, in most of the cases, in one of my cases or two of my cases, for the last five years, there has not been any income on those cases, whereas we are still struggling and we are still filing our quarterly uh, reports. Every year we are spending on the audit fee every year we are uh, like litigations, whatever litigations are going on, but there is no fee for the last uh, five years uh, because there is no asset, there is no realization, there is no distribution. So uh, these, these are many cases like this where the, uh, uh, the COC, uh, the, the stakeholders are not interested in any kind of solution. They are saying, that it is better that it, sh it should remain with the liquidator because the liquidator is fully regulated, liquidator is answerable to NCLT, liquidator is answerable to IBBI, and liquidator is much, much better than any kind of market player. And in case we try to sell it to the market players, then the market player will also take his profit and market player may also do something which is not advisable to be done, where the liquidator will not do that, but whereas some uh, kind of... Uh, out market player would try to do uh, some kind of collaborations with the accused uh, for diluting their litigation part and they can actually have some kind of uh, uh, understanding with them for their uh, mutual benefit. Then the stakeholders are also not interested in taking the assignments under regulation 37A uh, because see uh, the banks are really not interested in uh, taking over these kind of litigation 
some kind of contingent assets, some, some kind of uh, recovery processes, so that the stakeholders are not interested in taking over. Also, the stakeholders are not interested in taking the distribution because the distribution is also a kind of assignment of NRRA. And, but then the stakeholders are also not interested that we should write off the debtors, advances, claims, refunds, etc. And because these are onerous and these are burdensome. So then, uh, like in case we try to pass a resolution in the stakeholders meeting that we have seen the recovery process conducted by the decoder and we are convinced that these are not recoverable, these are onerous assets, and then we may actually disclaim and under Regulation 10. So that kind of uh, regulation, that kind of uh, uh, a resolution can be passed in Stakeholders Consultation Committee so that the company can be dissolved after carefully looking into the recoverability and non-recoverability, and then we can take a final decision. So as I said that the monthly fee is not being paid to the liquidators, so the liquidators are presently struggling for the last five years. I, I am struggling on actually five such cases where there is no fee for the last five years, but then we are complying with everything and we are actually uh, suffering because the uh, some of the assets are attached and some of the litigations are very important. So, and even uh, in, in these cases, uh, no fee is expected in the coming years and in case we don't do something and that this particular these kind of liquidation processes may continue for another five years now assignment offers which are coming from the market under regulation 37 capital a these are also being rejected by the stakeholders because see in 37 capital a we need the consent of the stakeholders now we are getting offers from the market players. They are saying that we are ready to take the assignment of all your uh, contingent assets like avoidance transactions, applications, and any kind of recoveries from advances, claims, refunds. So these are the assets that they are interested in taking over. And the offers they are giving that we would be working on this. And whenever the assets would be realized, one percentage would be given to the stakeholders and one percentage will be kept by us and we will do our expenditure we will do the litigation out of the proportion that we would keep with us now this kind of uh, uh, we i still couldn't understand the model of uh, uh, these uh, market players why i couldn't understand because my belief is that under this avoidance transactions the recovery is very, very difficult. Because in case, uh, uh, let us try to see that there is fraudulent transactions of 100 crore and the application is filed. So that means that the adjudicating authority will first decide and definitely the uh, the the affected party, the, the respondents will go to NCLAT and from NCLAT they will go to Supreme Court. So, it, the entire process may take a little longer than expected and the liquidator for all these years will uh, will handle these proceedings, uh, would deal with these proceedings, will spend on the lawyers, but the liquidator will not get any fee in case his fees on the regulation uh, four based. So uh, what is the uh, what is the model of these people? who are coming and are offering because my understanding is that if there is a order against third party regarding some preferential transaction that that can that can definitely bring some money to the company because those, those are third parties but any third party where some significant amount is involved will definitely go up to the supreme court to save that kind of obligation because most of these people would be uh, because in, in case these are related parties, then promoters will make sure that there is nothing left with those related parties and that no recovery is possible. However, in case of some third parties who are bona fide in their uh, business transactions with the corporate debtor, but somehow they landed into the provisions of Section 43 and they became 
somehow the preferential transaction respondents, then in those cases, it is slight possibility. And also in some cases of the undervalued transactions, where some recovery of the asset can be made. Because see, uh, there, are, there are consultants in the market and they definitely would guide to the all these respondents that how to safeguard uh, their financial interest. As you understand that those promoters who've gone into insolvency, they will not keep any asset in their own name. So the recovery, if the recovery is from their name, if the recovery is ordered by any court, the recovery is only possible in case they have some asset, in case they are, uh, the there is a possibility of recovery. But in case we have an order of hundreds of crores of rupees against a particular respondent, but then respondent doesn't have any money, so that money that order will of have, will have no use. That order will have no impact. So when there is no recovery possible in the next five, ten years or five, six years, because it, everyone will go to a Supreme Court. So what is the model of these? Uh, market player who are offering that you give us the assignment we will uh, fight it and whatever is recovered we will give some percentage to the creditors and some percent we will keep and maybe, be, maybe they, they they can also kind of charge uh, some expenditure from their own uh, but that's something which these some committees, some uh, stakeholders, consultation committees uh, have a they they have a mind to approve it, but when it goes to head office, the head office actually see that this can be uh, this can be detrimental to the interest of the overall objective of the IBC, giving it to the third party, and then that for that third party can collaborate with the respondents, and the respondents the definitely. Uh, uh, and they, they can collaborate with the respondents and instead of recovering uh, something from the um, uh, stakeholders from the from the respondents from the promoters the the collaboration will work in the benefit of the promoters and the model of uh, these market players is 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 not really bona fide so that information has gone to the banks so the banks are not accepting this kind of offers where the some third parties kind of offering uh, for the uh, third parties are offering for a kind of sharing model and are ready to take the assignment of all these avoidance transactions and other contingent assets. So the COC presently is really not interested in resolving these cases. So when the COC is not uh, interested, because he, as I said, the the NRRA difficulties also I have said one difficulty that there is a, a the clarity is required on the applicability of the stamp duty on the assignment of debt because when I'm assigning my debt in one of my company there are debts of 900 crore in case I assign uh, as per the Delhi stamp duty then I will have to pay 10% stamp duty otherwise that assignment would be invalid and Maybe that out of those 900, I have already reported fraudulent transactions of about 800 and 850 crores. So, so how do I deal with either I uh, write it off or I assign it? If I assign it, assign it to someone to make the uh, assignment valid, there may be a stamp duty. And in Delhi Stamp Duty Act, I have checked it is 10%. I mean, it is different from state to state. But then I am trying to advise all my fellow professionals, friends, that the stamp duty aspect must be seen while we are actually trying to assign the debt as not readily realizable asset. Now, in this uh, 37 capital A provisions, there is also a difficulty how to get a valuation done, how to uh, fix a reserve price, and finally, whether we should go for Swiss challenge or not, whether we should go for the inviting the expression of interest first and then they will do the due diligence and then after the due diligence they can participate into the Swiss challenge method. So these are uh, these are some kind of uh, uh, models in NRRA. So the what still I feel that if it is possible, uh, like if, if it is really possible, then sharing model may work in some cases. Uh, that the where the recovery so 
even in the case of recovery, if I sell my recovery to, if I sell my recovery to kind of uh, outside market players, then, so there are two ways of recovering. One is that settling with that person and getting the money in the bank account of the company. And the second is settling with that person where part of the money is received in the bank account and part of the money can be taken by the third parties who are the part like market players. So they can take their own benefit. They will work for their own profit. Even if they are offering that a monitoring committee would be uh, constituted and all these recoveries would be under the and under the supervision of the monitoring committee. But still, these private parties are not regulated. These private parties are, are not answerable to NCLT, not answerable to IBBI. So it is actually very difficult to pass on hundreds of crores of contingent assets to private parties and that too on future sharing basis. So the banks are not comfortable in taking such decisions. So when I'm saying everything that like this is also an RRA is not possible, the COC is not ready to take the assignment. So that means 37A is also not possible. The COC is also not interested in taking some distribution of all these uh, onerous assets. So that is uh, regulation 38 is also not possible. So when we are saying that this uh, uh, all this is not possible, then what should we what should be done? So the only way out that I find for the liquidators is like whatever assets we are able to sell, we should sell it. And while we distribute the proceeds of the uh, sale, we should keep a sufficient money with us so that we are able to fight the future litigations. And we should keep a provision for up to Supreme Court regarding the profit transactions. And that's what I think that is the only way that is the only way that actually can handle. So uh, then make efforts for realization, make efforts for realization, show those efforts to the adjudicating authority. Finally, make an application to the adjudicating authority for dissolution of the uh, company. In that application, in that application, we can say that these are the onerous assets and you can say you can apply regulation 10 and we can say that these are the onerous assets so we are kind of disclaiming it or, or writing it off. So we are actually writing off or disclaim under regulation 10. So this is basically disclaiming those uh, debts. Then we, we also invite expression of interest uh, from the public at large for an RRA, maybe without reserve price. And when some expression comes, then we can even uh, publish it for a Swiss challenge method. Then also make an effort for assignment to the stakeholders. Like so, we've tried to sell, we've tried to realize, we have uh, also uh, created evidences that we have made effort. We also try to call public interest into the NRRA. We also tried to assign it to the stakeholders. And finally, when everything is not happening, then file an application for dissolving the company. So whatever is left in that application, we can also make a prayer that these are the assets which are onerous and we also need the adjudicating authorities approval for disclaiming on these assets. Then we can say that some of the assets which are still left, which are not even onerous, which are even taking time, these, are based, these, these can be distributed to the stakeholders under regulation 38. Then we can say that uh, at, under regulation 44A, the treatment of avoidance transactions also can be assigned to can be assigned to the stakeholders maybe under regulation 37a or under regulation 44a so this application should be made to the adjudicating authority and then we should seek the directions from the adjudicating authority now in case the adjudicating authority says that you go and take the consent from the stakeholders, then we will say that we've already tried, but they are denying it. They are not voting for this. Then the adjudicating authority may say that you uh, 
make an effort further and then we can say that yes we, we can make another effort for one month and then we can again go back to the adjudicating authority so while the application is pending for dissolving the company we would not be required to file extension of the liquidation period applications number two we would not be uh, like of course the quarterly reports are required of course the yearly audit of the receipt and payment is required but the only careful part is that we should keep sufficient money with us for fighting the litigations for n number of years and otherwise uh, the otherwise we seek directions from the, the adjudicating authority that these are the asset or we distribute this asset to the stakeholder so these are the assets which are assigned which are being assigned to the stakeholders so these kind of orders can be taken from the adjudicating authority rather than not doing anything because see very very recently in the month of june 23 ibbi also uh, warned a, a, like a, a already issued a warning to an insolvency professional who actually delayed in filing the application for dissolution of the company and in other investigations which are actually or or inspections i can see that it is it's a regular kind of observation from the inspection authority of the ibbi that the liquidator has not filed the application for dissolution despite even after selling all the assets and the liquidator has not made any effort under regulation 37a for assignment so all these things are actually coming and uh, which is well then now in case we can say that the finally the uh, way out for the liquidator that's what we have discussed that this is the only way in the prayer we can use regulation 10 we can also use regulation 37a we can also use regulation 38 for different kind of assets and also 44a so in one application we can make all the prayers and after all the prayers then we can say that then the company can be dissolved so i think at this moment i would like to take some questions and let me see uh today ankit is not uh uh, in India, so he is uh, because of the timing differences. So he is not participating into this uh, weekly webinars. So we actually have a question from B S Prasad: Is it necessary to close liquidation bank account prior to filing of dissolution? No, it is not necessary to close the liquidation bank account uh, before filing. The application can be filed. And once every other issue is resolved by the adjudicating authority, then adjudicating authority will tell you, now you go and close the bank account and in the next hearing, give us a report so that a certificate from the bank, then we will pass the resolution order. But then in some cases, I also have got certain cases where after the closure of the bank account, another litigation started. So then, so what I am trying to say is that before we close the bank account, we should actually... Uh, have an arrangement with a law firm that from this time to this time, this is a fee that we are giving you in advance so that in case of any litigation, you would take care. So that fee should go to that uh, law firm and then only the bank account should be closed. Now, the other is, is it necessary to serve the application for dissolution to the concerned ROC? No, it is not required. Only the dissolution order is required to be circulated. It is to be to be uh, is, uh, passed on to the ROC uh, within seven days of the dissolution order. Then we have a question, what about the onerous property? Will the dissolution still be given in case of liquidator has filed an application to declare a property as onerous? Is there any relevant case regarding this? So I couldn't find any case law on onerous properties. I am saying onerous property is basically right off. Because the asset is cumbersome, it is difficult to realize, it is uh, expensive, it is expensive to realize and in, in most of these assets are already reported in the fraudulent uh, transaction applications. So therefore, these assets should be disclaimed. I want to disclaim these assets. So this disclaim also can be part of the dissolution application. There is no need to file a separate application to the adjudicating authority on on disclaimer on the onerous assets so this can be part of the uh, application for dissolving the company so uh, then we have dsr irp if some assets could not be sold in spite of best efforts by liquidator 
what is the option left? No, I said, as I said, in case the assets are there, it depends the, depends from the kind of asset. Otherwise, we can also uh, file an application along with the dissolution application and we can apply regulation 38 and we can say, we can ask the adjudicating authority, we can actually make one of the prayer that this is one asset which is despite all these things that we are not able to sell. So I would like to distribute it to the, uh, the, to the uh, stakeholders. So I think that can be distributed to the stakeholders under regulation 38 because regulation 38 also needs adjudicating authority approval. So that can be done in case the adjudicating authority accepts it. But in any case, the liquidator must show the intent to close the company, dissolve the company. Now, the other question from B.S. Prasad is, if the liquidation account is closed, how to pay expenses during the period when application for dissolution is under adjudication? Now, I've, I've never said that the liquidation account is required to be closed on at the time of making an application. I said, finally, when other issues would be closed, the adjudicating authority will ask you to close the bank account. And then in the next hearing, the dissolution order will be passed. At that time, you be careful that all future expenditures should be paid in advance to the law firm, to the lawyers. And that's what is the only option with the, but otherwise it is, the, as far as the advocate's fee is concerned, that can be paid in advance before closing the bank account. Prakash V is asking, is it not good to, is it not good good in procedure for the RP to first apply for the liquidation? The liquidator may then apply for early dissolution. See, as I said, Regulation 13 talks about early dissolution. However, this is a, this is a liquidation process regulation, so the, it is not applicable to the resolution professional. The bench, multiple benches are saying that the RP cannot make an application for dissolution of the company, it's only the liquidator who can make an application for dissolution. However, in some of the cases, the NCLT said that the adjudicating authority has rightly dissolved the company when there is no asset, when there is no claim, when there is no uh, uh, nothing pending. So that is in one case. But technically, to my understanding also, RP cannot make an application for dissolving. It is only the liquidator who can actually apply after, after the preliminary report. The liquidator will file a preliminary report and then file early uh, dissolution. We have a question from Kishore Sony. Can the liquidator offer the unrealized asset to the creditors in place of actual cash? Yes, the liquidator can use Regulation 38. And Regulation 38 doesn't need the stakeholder's consent. It is only requiring the consent of the adjudicating authority. The adjudicating authority must be convinced that the RP, the liquidator has made efforts. These assets are uh, very, very difficult and onerous assets. And these assets can be distributed to the stakeholders. I mean, that is where the Regulation 38 would be helping us. Then again, DSR IRP says, can you, can you, through some throw some light on receivables sale, uh, which is a difficult task. I have already said that sale of receivables is very, very difficult. The market players are offering a percentage on recovery. Now, market players are not regulated by IBBI. They are not answerable to NCLT. So therefore, the stakeholders are not trusting the market players. The market players are offering in advance a very, very small amount. And in some cases, it is not even being offered some small amount also. So it is difficult to sell because see for sale, in case we go to regulation 31 capital A, we actually need to see, see the consent of the stakeholders for, a, for, a, for the sale of the assets. So therefore for sale of receivables also, we have to conduct the process we have to take the consent of the stakeholders. So that may not come in the case of stakeholders sale. Can distribution under regulation 38 be made without consideration being received? Now the distribution to the stakeholders is based on the valuation. It is not based on the consideration. The valuation of, of that asset has to be there and that valuation should be consented by the stakeholders, then only can be distributed. The distribution to the stakeholders will be 
without receiving any money that is the asset is being distributed whatever way the asset is being used by the uh, stakeholder that is their uh, outlook whether they would like to sell it in future or they would like to use it that is their outlook but whatever is the valuation of the asset that actually will be considered as distributed to that particular stakeholder madan vaishnava please suggest how one can go for asset tracing and investigation of asset of suspended directors are there any specialized agencies who does this work liquidator is not supposed to investigate into the assets of the suspended directors the liquidator can only pursue the applications filed under section 43 45 49 50 and 66 it is not the duty of the liquidator to trace the assets of the suspended directors the liquidator is only required to trace the assets owned by the company take control and custody of those assets sell those assets realize those assets but the liquidator has got no duty to look into the investigation of the assets owned by the promoters then i have this uh, i maheshwar the question is if assignment of 100 crore are done at rupees 5 lakh stamp duty will be paid on 5 lakhs only no i believe the stamp duty would be paid on 100 crores because we are authorizing someone with an assignment to recover 100 crore the debt is recoverable or not that is something which is a secondary presently the value of the debt is 100 crore maybe even it is contingent but the stamp duty would be applicable on 100 not on the sale value because see the stamp duty is being paid on the assignment of debt and it is not on the consideration of the sale process now the cms sandeep goel is asking how to file dissolution application when liquidation cost is pending so if the liquidation cost is pending and that means there is some expectation from some assets there is some expectation of recovery from some assets and if that is the expectation then the liquidator cannot file a dissolution application the dissolution application can only be filed when the when the, the when the possibility of recovery is very very less so if we are expecting that the liquidation cost would be recovered out of the contingent assets or out of the litigation then of course we have to wait because filing the dissolution application while even your liquidation cost is not recovered that is not advisable but yes in such cases in case you feel that there is no likelihood of getting recovery of your dissolution cost then early dissolution is advisable under regulation 13 Ravi Bansal is asking how to get the valuation done under NRRA. Now it depends upon the asset, Ravi ji, that the asset can be uh, some litigation asset. Then the in the litigation asset, the valuation can be done uh, based on the opinion of the lawyer, based on the due diligence of the uh, valuers, securities and financial asset valuer. In case the uh, asset is uh, a kind of uh, puffy transactions. again this valuation can be done and the valuation is to be done by the securities and financial assets but in case uh, uh, there are some uh, capital asset there are some land there are some other equipment which is disputed so that also can be valued first the valuation of the land and then the discounting by the disputes valuation can be done that is not a problem however there may be a possibility that while the securities and financial asset valuer is valuing it he may have to engage an expert to understand the uh, possibility of winning this case or how much recovery is possible he may engage another expert he may engage another lawyer who will understand the case and then give an opinion how much could be recovered now if the company is dissolved the proceeds of profit transactions how they will be distributed who will distribute how the liquidator can get his fee now in case the uh, company is being dissolved by with the directions by the adjudicating authority that the profit transactions are being assigned to the stakeholders then the liquidator has not realized anything 
the liquidator has not distributed anything and the company is dissolved, the liquidator will not get his fee. However, the liquidator will get will be free from that assignment. The liquidator is presently being uh, like under a lot of uh, 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 see adverse scenarios where the liquidator is working very hard without any fee for the last five years. Because uh, I, I am working in, in one case for the last uh, five and a half year because in the very first six months, I sold whatever small asset was there. But now it's only because of the litigation I, I'm, I'm suffering. So we are trying to now file applications under uh, the uh, whatever we are discussing today. We are filing in our cases the dissolution application where the assets, at least assets are sold. And in case there are some assets, then we will say that these are onerous assets and we want to disclaim. So this is the uh, the the result that we have thought. Uh, the then the Rachana Junjunwala is asking what about non relinquished uh, non relinquished property. Now I think the law is very clear that the liquidator has to deal with the only those properties which are relinquished to the liquidation estate of the corporate debtor. Any those properties which are not relinquished. And the law is very clear that within six months, in case they are not able to sell, then it will come back to the liquidator and the liquidator will start selling them. So that is not a question because in case the properties are not relinquished, then the uh, those stakeholders have to sell that. In case the uh, surface is applicable to them, in case they are covered under surface law, then uh, the property, in case they are not relinquishing, they have to give an account. They they have to give an account. Otherwise, again, uh, that uh, estimated value, estimated valuation based recovery can be made from that lender, and the liquidation process can be closed. Estimated based on the evaluation, the recovery can be made. Ujwal Kalita says when a CD can be transferred as a going concern under Regulation Thirty Seven A. If the CD has only one property, land subject to litigation, which is not readily realizable. So the CD cannot be transferred, but then the asset can be assigned to someone. Uh, or if there is a one, if there is only one property, which is uh, uh, the, uh, which is the, or which is under litigation, then I believe uh, the better solution is sell the company as a going concern so that the going concern, when we sell it as a going concern, so all the uh, litigation rights also go to the buyer. So 37A assignment and then liquidating the company, uh, that is also possible that we can assign that all that uh, whatever property that we have, we can assign that. That is also possible. But selling the company as a going concern would be actually better. Can trade receivables over four years old where the debtor is also under liquidation be deemed to be onerous asset? Yes, I think these are these are onerous assets. That one, that the company is, it is not recoverable. The other company is under liquidation. The already it is uh, almost uh, time barred. So these are onerous assets. These are all difficult assets, difficult to recover. So we can actually make an application to, to, to dissolve the company and uh, uh, get the approval for the disclaiming the onerous assets. Then the Mr. Prakash is asking the cases where no fee is paid to the liquidator for five years, what is the option available for the liquidator? He cannot be spending endlessly. Now the option available is only to file immediately dissolution application. Let the adjudicating authority decide adjudicating authority. In case the adjudicating authority say that it is not possible to dissolve the company, then the adjudicating authority will direct the stakeholders to pay the money to the liquidator in case there are stakeholders. So therefore, Liquidator should not keep everything within itself. Liquidator should file the application for dissolving the company, file the application for disclaiming the onerous asset, file the application for assignment of the uh, NRRA, the file the application for distribution of the assets. The liquidator should not suffer. This is what is the my study for the last five days that the liquidator should actively file, actively file dissolution applications. So let the adjudicating authority decide whether the liquidator has to suffer or it has to be contribution has to come from the stakeholders or the company will go for dissolution and whatever the stakeholders are expecting from the liquidation process, that also would not be expected by them. 
So the uh, the COC is the the stakeholders are not accepting liquidators' request nowadays for any kind of fee, for any kind of assignment, for any kind of distribution, or for any kind of write-off. It is only the adjudicating authority would understand the circumstances and then will take a decision. And we are hoping that since the adjudicating authority capacity has increased from uh, from Monday onwards, we expect that the disposals would be much, much faster now. Ravi Bansal is asking whether the annual accounts under the Companies Act 2023 is required to get audited in case the company under liquidation and file income tax return and submit accounts to the office of the ROC. In case the company is being kept as a going concern during the liquidation process, then it is yes. Otherwise, if the company is not being kept as a going concern under the uh, liquidation process, then there is no requirement of preparing an audited balance sheet. It is only required to prepare a receipt and, receipt and payment account, get it audited once in a year and submit to the NCLT. Also, income tax return is not required to be filed unless there is an income unless there is an income in the during the liquidation process and the tax has been deducted then you can file an income tax return otherwise there is no requirement of filing income tax return because the income tax return would not be accepted without the audited balance sheet without tax audit so audited balance sheet is not required tax audit is not required in case the company is not being uh, kept as a going concern Suja Patnaik says, can we dissolve the company and then sell the assets thereafter, liquidate it? No, we have to sell the assets first and then we have to apply for dissolution. Is the consent required? The consent for consent for filing an application <clears throat> to dissolve the company is not required. Consent for uh, consent for NRRA assignment is required from stakeholders. Consent for uh, assignment of uh, avoidance transaction application is required from the stakeholders. Approval of the adjudicating is required for disclaiming the onerous property. Approval of the adjudicating is required for distribution of the assets to the stakeholders. <clears throat> IP Gulshan is asking, as per the last available balance sheet, possession of the assets, possession of uh, uh, assets of crores of rupees not handed over to the liquidator audited financial statements for previous years prior to CIRP not available, books of accounts are seized by Delhi police, how to proceed for dissolution in such case, such a situation. Actually, the first task is to, uh, the, see, the uh, in case we read the regulation, very, very important task given to the liquidator is to complete the books of accounts of the company. Whatever the last balance sheet that we have, auditory balance sheet, we will reach out to that auditor. We will take the item-wise trial balance from that auditor. And then we will take the bank statement and we'll try to restructure the accounts. And, and we see in case we, we are able to do that, then whatever assets details that we have, we'll seek the details from the stakeholders, we'll seek the details from the claimant. And whatever we are able to find, then we'll present, either we are able to sell it in case we are not able to sell it, then again file an application for dissolution of the company. CMS Sandeep Goyal is asking, there are no assets with the company liquidation cost to be paid by secured financial creditors only. Yes, it is to be paid by them only. If there is no asset, they will pay the liquidation cost. And in case there is no asset, I think the application should for, for dissolving the company should be filed. And within that application, a prayer should be made to for seeking directions, seeking directions. Uh, for payment of or for contribution. That's what is the uh, requirement. So I think we have uh, done a lot today. One hour is uh, definitely a little shorter subject. In fact, I had much more things to discuss. I had also prepared for uh, the uh, what kind of record is required to be kept, for how many years it is required to be kept, and also what the company law says as far as this existing law of the land is concerned. And also, I would say very briefly, whatever we do during the liquidation process, that has to be retained. But whatever assets of the company and for records of the company that we get from the um, promoters or uh, RP, that has to be kept because I... Uh, I am getting that benefit because see, even after selling every asset, 
no i have seen the cbi have started inquiry because the banks have started filing their fraud applications after three four years of liquidation processes then all the cbi people are coming to the liquidators and they are asking for the, all the records of the company for the last 10 years it is lucky we are lucky that we have kept those records so we are now able to show it to cbi and in some cases ed therefore i would say <clears throat> in sfiu also all the liquidators must keep the records of the company all their ledgers vouchers files should must be kept and all this cost is liquidation cost so therefore the liquidator's job is also very very difficult and especially in those cases where there is no asset and this actually will become a loss making uh, uh, venture in case you are a liquidator for a company where there is hardly any asset or a very very small amount of asset but your assignment can continue for 10 years and in fact i have i am suffering i am presently handling uh, uh, 11 liquidation cases where there is no fee coming for the last so many years but uh, we are only struggling but now uh, we have decided that we'll go for the dissolving these companies i know that the adjudicating authority will not allow but yes we would make our case we will argue and then we will see how it is possible to seek direction for the assignment for the distribution and also for the disclaimer on the owner's assets thank you very much uh, participant it is really a pleasure for me to work and share my uh, experiences with all of you so today's uh, uh, webinar is getting concluded thank you very much in participating in large numbers thank you